Joining us from Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides, all this between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Well then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated and let us sing our sermon. Dear hearers of the Word of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord our living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Back when I was in the fourth grade in uh, Elbert Lee, Minnesota, my parents decided to uh, take a trip to Minneapolis. My, my, my aunt lived there and a couple of my cousins. And we were in Elbert Lee, about 90 miles away. And uh, I said, well, what else are we going to do? You know, fourth grader. Um, well, we're maybe we'll see a movie, and right away I got excited because what was what was playing was Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, you know. And I thought, well, maybe we can see that, or the Aristocats, you know, a Disney movie about these cartoon cats, and everybody wants to be a cat because a cat's the only cat who knows where it's at, right? And I thought, okay, we'll do a movie. I go, what movie are we going to see? I turned to my twin brother and I go, we're going to what? I go, what's it about? And he looks at me, what do you think it's about? It's about a pitter in the room. <laughs> I had no idea what it was, you know. And my parents are pretty artsy and I'm like, oh, good, okay, thanks mom, dad. Sure there is a Godzilla movie we can see instead, you know. So we went to it and, and uh, you know, we started watching, you know, got, got into it. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I loved it. And if someone, raise your hand if you've ever heard of this movie or seen it, maybe. Okay, all right. So, and, and uh, the song that kept coming in my mind, the one that I kept singing, you'll never guess. Well, that one was one of them, but also. How did you know that? Oh, she's my wife. Okay, good. <laughs> if I were a rich man, you know? And uh, it's a great tune. It kind of, you know, he just gets into it, you know? And he's singing. And he's like, wow, this guy's pretty funny. He talks about one long staircase just going up. Another one longer coming down. Oh, wait a minute. Don't they go both? I was trying to think. Of what, oh, I get it. One going nowhere just for show, you know, they had all this stuff, never had to work hard, you know. And I think, well, yeah, wouldn't we all like to be that way? You know, I, I've often thought of that, you know, what would it be like uh, to be a rich man? Wouldn't that solve all my problems? You know, and I've, I've, I've never done it thinking if I win the lottery or 
pull tab or gambling. I only thought I would imagine if I won the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. So. And if you believe that. You can. But you know, we think about that. But what would, you know, what, wouldn't that solve all of our problems? If I were a rich man, if money, wouldn't that just solve everything, right? I mean, that, that's what the song's about. We laugh about it, but then deep down inside we think, well, yeah, it, that would take care of it. Think of all the problems it would solve. Uh, it would just take care of everything. But then Jesus said last Sunday, last Sunday, you can't serve God and mammon. <laughs> Riches, or mammon refers to money and the things that it can possess and buy, material possessions. So, you have one hand, if I were a rich man, we'd take care of all of our problems. And we think, yeah, that, that would, you know. Oftentimes, in a lot of cases, it would solve some problems, but wouldn't take care of everything. Now, why did Jesus say you can't serve God and mammon? He could have said you can't serve God in politics, or you can't serve God in sports, you know, and then Monday night, there's going to be a battle, you know, and who knows who's going to win, but, but, you know, that's Monday night football, so who knows, but. Uh, there could have said a number of things. Jesus could have said a number of things about what you can't serve. A lot of things that can be competitors with God. He didn't. He didn't pick all those different ones. He said God and mammon, God and money. Why did he say that? Well, he's after our hearts. And he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Our second reading today, uh, it's from an old pastor, an old, an old pastor, Paul, okay, writing to a young one, Timothy, even though it says Timothy, the, it's from the book of Timothy, but it's Paul's letter to Timothy. And what do you do as an older person wanting to give advice to a younger one? Well, you look back at your life and you start reflecting on things that were important. What, what really counted? What was really important? What mattered? What did you see that you could help uh, uh, pass on to someone to, to stop, to not repeat the same mistakes you did, right? Or to say, hey, stay away from this thing. You know, I saw a lot of people kind of do this type of thing, and it really troubled them. And it was really bad for them and for a lot of people. So here's my advice to you. That, that's kind of what, what the letter is. Well, what does he say? What does he say? Well, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then their eagerness to become rich, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves. Interesting word he used there, pierced themselves. He's, he's a pastor talking to a younger pastor. We think of the word pierced. What do you think of? Jesus on the cross being pierced. And he said, they have pierced themselves. <laughs> They have pierced themselves with many pains. Now, now, why did Paul say that? He could have said a lot of things. No, he does say a lot of things. That was just one part of it. But he could have said the, the love of status is the root of all kinds of evil. Or he could have said the love of power is the root of all kinds of evil. He, he could have said a number of things. And he had the whole letter to write it out. But he didn't. He, he didn't say those other things. He said the love of money. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Paul and Jesus knew something that is still true today. That money and material possessions are, a special, are especially uh, prominent candidates, not for being president, but for uh, candidates for idolatry. That is, taking the place of God. Now let's say, let's take someone from a few years later than Paul uh, and Jesus into our own tradition, right? Okay. Uh, this guy, Martin Luther. Uh, he said this, a man needs to experience, as a Christian, three conversions. Three conversions. The first one, the conversion of the heart, where faith springs up. And God reaches you and 
changes in your inside. That's your heart, your will. That, that's that's the conversion. Uh, the another, the other one is the conversion of the mind. Be renewed by the by the transformation of your mind. You know, do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's what Paul says. Luther says the same thing. He quotes Paul on that. Understands that it's it's heart and mind. And the third thing he says, the conversion. Of the purse, where it translates into reactive action. Heart, mind, and the purse. Now, in ancient uh, Middle Europe, middle where, where France is now, you had people like this. They were called the Gauls, G A U L S. And they were a warlike people in, in ancient times, and they inhabited. Uh, which is now France and Belgium and that area, and they gave the Roman conquerors all sorts of trouble. Uh, they they spoke a Celtic language. They were druid druids. Uh, they were they worshipped nature and they sacrificed people to, to get to get the gods to plant the, to, to bless their crops and their growing. And uh, you've seen Stonehenge, you know that sort of thing. That, that's kind of what their background is. Very fierce people. And, and very uh, uh, unwilling to change their attitudes very easily. Uh, by the time of by the time of Christ, uh, Europe was converted mostly, uh, and uh, or after Christ, when the when the Romans uh, got there, or, or kind of settled them down. By the time the Christians got there, uh, they were pretty much tamed. Okay, uh, the extent of their being controlled by Rome uh, varied, however, depending how far away they were from the Roman outposts uh, during the Roman time. And they were, there was uprising. They, were, they fought the Romans. By the time the Christians got there, they had simmered down a little bit. But they still had that attitude. Okay? They still had that. A number of Christian missionaries uh, went in there and converted them. Maybe they became Christian. Uh, but what happened when a converted warrior, one of these guys with the, you know, take their pick, I don't know, whichever one, uh, whenever they were baptized and they did it by immersion, that's the, that was the early tradition, uh, they would uh, be baptized, they would hold one of their hands above the water, <coughs> generally their right arm, the dominant arm. And uh, it seemed like a peculiar custom to the missionaries because they didn't quite understand what was going on. And they soon learned the reason why. Why, why did they hold one hand above the water? Well, they soon learned that when the next skirmish of another tribe or another people came up, this now Christian, uh, this now Christian Gaul, <laughs> would uh, proclaim, this hand is not baptized. <laughs> We'd pick up his hammer and, or spear and, and then unchristianly uh, ride off to destroy his enemy and club him in the head with his arm that was not baptized. Now it sounds kind of weird, you know, I'll say, what? That doesn't sound very true. Uh, some would say it's the medieval equivalent of an urban legend, you know. Uh, but something about that kind of can ring true for us. Why? Uh, well, can you imagine someone, any Christian, saying, well, this part of me is not baptized. I, this is completely different, separate from God, and the rest of me is, but this part isn't. What is it that we want to keep out of the water? Right? What do we want to keep dry? Times, it's our wallets. <laughs> Even baptized people like to keep their money dry. But imagine Christians going underwater, being baptized. You know, we have often infant baptism here. But imagine, imagine with me, you know, a baptistry, and, and right before they go, I said, oh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Let me take my check. Just keep that dry. 
Not yet. Not yet. It's not something that uh, we can see or we can laugh at that. But is it true? Many of us try to rope off this one area in our lives as off limits. You know? It's not God's business what all that has to happen. God doesn't have anything to do with me, you know, in that regard. It's off limits to spiritual inspection. It's nobody's business what I do with my money. But then we realize too late how foolish that sounds. It's just like the guys, this arm's not baptized, my wallet's not baptized. It's off limits. Of course it's God's business, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all those that dwell therein. Jesus is after our hearts. That's why he tells this parable. Early before our uh, reading in, in, the, in the Bible, there's headings, there's paragraphs. And he's talking to the Pharisees, and, and, and Luke says, the Pharisees came, and they were, the lo they were lovers of money. Okay? And he has a conversation about them. They're catching him about the boars and this. And then he goes into this parable. They were lovers of money. Jesus tells us and gets us thinking about the traps that accompany wealth. Again, uh, Tim, uh, Peter or Paul uh, writing to Timothy, you know, don't go that, don't go down that road. The love of money is it's a root of all kinds of evil. People have pierced themselves, <laughs> they've crucified themselves in the pursuit of it, and, and it's just it's unnecessary. Our prayer of the day. We, we prayed it this morning. Keep us from those things that harm us. From Amos, alas, for those who are at ease in Zion, for those who feel secure on Mount, Sin on Mount Samaria. Our Psalm, Psalm 4, we read it responsibly. We, 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 we responded. Happy are those who, who, happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. Jesus, in his parable today, attacks the common notion back then, was that if you were wealthy, God blessed you. If you were poor or sick or injured, God was mad at you. That's, that was the easiest explanation, and, and uh, that's, that's how it is in science now. The easiest explanation is the, is the best one, the best theory. And that's when a lot of people had the theory of God. Obviously, God shined his light on this rich man. That's why all our problems will be over if you're a rich man. Uh, and if you're not, if you're Lazarus, poor, lame, can't, can't, get, can't get, any, get anything off the ground, uh, you'd, you'd be satisfied with the crumbs of the table. Obviously, he did something wrong. He's a great sinner. But Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't get into that at all. Again, why focus on on riches and wealth. Well, from the time of Amos to the time of Jesus and Timothy, all the way up to 2016, uh, people interpreted their prosperity as proof of divine favor and blessing. Well, God rescued us from the Exodus, right? If you're Jewish. That's our history. God would certainly deliver us from any other future danger. And that's what Amos is attacking. They they were luxuriating in the material of plenty. And they felt little, little concern for any, anybody else except their own ease. What happened to people mattered little. The parable of the rich man is interesting. There's a painting of the rich man. Which one is he? I, I looked at that and I'm like, well, which? I couldn't tell which one was Lazarus because it was painted and they all were wearing stuff. And then... I said, oh yeah, the dogs. <laughs> They're licking his sores. It's like, ugh. Don't even... What's going on, Jesus? Why do you have to say that? Well, how bad it's been. What's going on? Why the discrepancy? <laughs> the story's purpose is not to give us a little literal uh, description of the afterlife. Nor does it say that all rich people are headed straight for hell. It doesn't say that. How 
how do we use what God has given us? This parable that Jesus tells us, it, it makes us uncomfortable because it, it gets rid and destroys the illusion of security. Uh, the security of saying, well, because we have financially set, therefore everything's set, even after, afterwards, after we die. The sin of the rich man is not that he's rich, but that he failed to use what he had rightly. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I'm going to give you a lot of stuff. You're going to be blessed. You'll have a wealth. You'll be one of the richest people in the world. But God said, I want to bless you so that you can become a blessing. The rich man didn't remember that being a child of Abraham meant that, blessed to be a blessing. In fact, we don't even know what his name is. It's just a rich man. We know who Lazarus is. Perhaps that's what Jesus is getting into. I read one commentary that said this, his riches kept him from seeing his true identity as being a child of Abraham, being blessed to be a blessing. Being a child of Abraham meant not only being, being blessed, being privileged, but having a responsibility. Why the parable? Why the dead end? How come not even a miracle can change things? Someone comes, send someone back, Father Abraham, send, send Lazarus back from the dead and Warn my brothers. Then they'll, then they'll leave. I said, no, sorry. Not even a miracle will change their minds. If they don't hear, if they don't, they haven't listened to the word, they're not going to believe a miracle. So why does Jesus tell this parable? Where's the good news in this? It's from, it's from our gospel, right? The gospel of Luke. Gospel means good news. What's the good news? Well, like the rich man and his brothers, we also have access to the riches of God, the Word of God, Jesus, the Word made flesh. We don't need miracles. We don't need people being raised from the dead. We have the living Word, and we have the written Word, the spoken Word, the sung Word. We have the promises of God that we can access the same word that Jesus used when he fought the devil when he was in the wilderness. Jesus didn't use a stick or a slingshot or a, or a spear against the devil. He used the word of God. That's what we have. The word speaks to us today. And what does it say to us? What does it remind us? That it is not what we possess or don't possess that give us our identity. What matters is who possesses us. Who has ransomed us with his own blood? Who has uh, paid, our, paid the price of our sins, not with silver or gold, but with his holy and precious blood and innocent suffering and death? It's Jesus himself. That's the good news. Our status with God <laughs> is out of our hands. And into the hands whose hands were pierced for our sake. They weren't pierced because he was searching for riches and he couldn't get it and never had enough and kept searching until he died. No, his hands were pierced for our sake. St. Paul says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And since Christ now is our life, we don't have to keep on hanging on to things or searching after things. Greed is concerned with getting, and the gospel is concerned with giving. What did Jesus give us? He has given us Jesus, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that by his poverty, his giving of himself, we might be. We've got nothing to lose. 
Thanks be to God who has given us the privilege, the responsibility, the blessing to share what he has given us. Ourselves, our time, our possessions, our life, our salvation. We don't have to imagine if we were a rich man. We are. Because of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay.